the third anniversary of the birth of the United States Victory Fleet, men of the Merchant Marine Academy and the Maritime Service parade down Lower Broadway in New York City. The Victory Fleet's third birthday is dedicated to American shipping companies, whose ships and personnel have maintained the global lifelines of a nation at war. stand are the Commandant of the Eastern Seaboard, the Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, and Vice Admiral Emery Land, War Shipping Administrator. Special awards are made to 85 New York steamship companies who, under the War Shipping Administration, have helped to carry out a great and perilous transport job. At Dumbarton Oaks, Washington, a Chinese delegation replaces Soviet Russia in conversations on post-war security. Dr. Wellington Koo, China's chairman, with Finance Minister Young and Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Britain's Halifax, Cadogan, and America's Statinius. Dr. Koo expresses the spirit of the conferences. The establishment of an effective international peace organization is the united hope and aspiration of all the freedom-loving peoples who have been making such heroic sacrifices in life, blood, and toil. We owe it to them, as well as to humanity at large, to subordinate all other considerations to the achievement of our common object. Following six weeks of meetings by representatives of Britain, Russia, and the United States, the entrance of China's delegation brings the discussions into a second phase, laying a foundation for future talks among all the United Nations on organizing for security in a world at peace. Chinese homeland, meanwhile, presidential emissary Donald M. Nelson leaves the headquarters of the Military Council in Chongqing with General Joseph Stilwell and Major General Patrick Hurley. Stilwell, recently promoted to full four-star general's rank, conferred with Hurley, production expert Nelson, and Chinese leaders, including Chief of Staff General Ho Ying Chin. Allied forces move ahead. General MacArthur's infantry, knee-deep in the mud of the New Guinea jungle, move inland with their native guides toward Itape, where 50,000 Japanese have been isolated. Planes drop supplies and ammunition to American units far from their base. With a surprise amphibious attack on Sanzapur, on the western end of Dutch New Guinea, American 6th Army troops outflank the last enemy position there. Veterans of months of southwest Pacific jungle fighting close in on the Japanese a relentless offensive against the final enemy garrisons on New Guinea. Now, far north of New Guinea, following successful occupation of Saipan, the target is the Palau.
climaxing an 11-day air-sea hammering, a large United States Navy amphibious force like those which won the Gilberts, the Marshalls, and the Marianas smashes at Palaliu Island, east of the Philippines. Amphibious combat vehicles and landing boats surge to shore under heavy fire. ships discharge more mechanized equipment. Men of the 1st Marine Division go into action once again. The small rocky island of Palaliu, site of the finest airfield in the Palaus, is defended by 8,000 Japanese. Temporarily pinned down at the edge of a lagoon, the Marines blast back with every weapon. the enemy. This invasion is part of a double blow at the last important bases guarding the Philippines. In fighting as severe as any in the Pacific so far, American casualties are many. The first wounded come back from the front for evacuation. Under air protection, Marines take this valuable airstrip. In the smoldering wreckage of enemy equipment and in the 10,000 Japanese lives so far lost in the Palau's campaign is evidence of the strong determination to liberate the Philippines.